Amen. Amen. Well, I appreciate you having me here today. It's a great honor to be here at Faithful Word Baptist Church. I'm appreciative to your pastor, Pastor Anderson, <coughs> and he's been a big influence in my life. And I'm appreciative, for, of course, for Brother Corbin. I had the pleasure of meeting Brother Corbin in uh, Boise. We were double booked at um, Verity Boise when it was Verity Boise, and I had a good time talking to him and spending time with him, and you're blessed to have him here in Tucson. And so I'm grateful to be here. And so we're there in Jonah chapter number 4. And if you would look back at verse number 1, Jonah for 1, the Bible says, <clears throat> But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before to Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Notice verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry. And as you read the book of Jonah, and here Jonah chapter number 4, we see the type of person that Jonah was, the type of man that he was. We see a man who is very disgruntled in life. We see a man who is very dissatisfied with his life. We see an angry man, and you have to wonder, what was it about Jonah that consumed him, that made him angry, that made him disgruntled, that made him so angry? Keep your place here in Jonah 4, but go to Hebrews 12, if you would. Hebrews chapter number 12. And you see, there was something that took hold of this man, Jonah. And unfortunately, what took hold of him is the same thing that takes hold of many people in the world. And we see people who are disgruntled, who are dissatisfied, who are angry at life. And there was something that took hold of this man, Jonah. In Hebrews 12, look at verse number 14. Hebrews 12, 14, the Bible says, notice, Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Notice verse number 15, it says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest, lest any what? Notice this phrase, Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And notice, and thereby many be defiled. You see, what's it called of Jonah was this thing of bitterness. It was the root of bitterness. Of bitterness. And in verse 15 it says, looking diligently. What does that mean? It means watching, being watchful, being careful, watching diligently, unless, unless what? Unless any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And notice it says, and thereby, notice, many be defiled. You see, many people have been defiled because of bitterness in their life. And what is bitterness? Bitter, I looked it up in the, in the dictionary, bitterness is being resentful. Bitterness is holding a grudge. Bitterness is being unhappy or angry over something that happened in the past. And in Jonah, we see a man who was overcome with that root of bitterness. But see, in the same way, today relationships are hurt because of this root of bitterness. You know, divorce happens because of bitterness. One spouse gets bitter over another. People quit on God because they get bitter with people in church. Or they quit on God because they get bitter with the pastor or with the leadership. It says that many people are defiled by this root of bitterness. He replaced her. In, actually, go, go through to Mark chapter 7. Mark 7. You see, bitterness is a sin that can destroy you. Man. And the Bible says that thereby many be defiled. Many people have been ruined over this thing of being bitter. Of that root of bitterness. And... You know, bitterness is a sin that, that is, you can't really identify in people. It's a sin that happens on the inside. The Bible says that there are some sins that are go open that are open before before all men, that we can just notify and see in people, hey, this person is in this sin. But bitterness is in your heart. Yeah. You might be bitter right now and nobody can see it. You might be bitter, but we can't see it because bitterness happens where in the heart. And the Bible talks about these sins in the heart that can defile you, that can hurt you, that can destroy your life. You're there in Mark 7. Look at verse number 20. The Bible says, Mark 7, 20. And he said, notice, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, notice, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these things come from, notice, within, and what? And defile the man. You see, bitterness happens where? It happens in your heart. And this sin, this root of bitterness, can harm your relationships with your friends, can harm your relationships in your family, can harm your relationships in your spouse, in your church, in your job. This root of bitterness is something that can take hold of you and it can absolutely consume you in your life. And in Jonah, we see a man who is consumed with that root of bitterness. We see a man who is disgruntled, dissatisfied, unhappy in life because he allowed 
that root of bitterness to take hold of him. Go back to Jonah chapter number 4. And this morning I want to talk to you and preach to you about the root of bitterness. I want to talk to you about where bitterness comes from. I want to talk to you about how bitterness grows in your life. I want to talk to you about the result of bitterness and what can it do in your life. And at the end, I want to talk about the solution to bitterness. So first, you're back in Jonah 4. Let's see the source of bitterness. How is it that bitterness comes about? What is the source? How does bitterness begin? Well, in Jonah 4, look at verse number 1. It says, but notice, but, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. I want you to notice it says, but it. There was something that displeased Jonah. You see, if you have bitterness in your heart, there is a source for that bitterness. There's a reason why you're bitter. There's a reason where that anger, that resentment came from. And here we're going we're gonna to look back and see what was the source of bitterness for Jonah. It says in verse 4, in verse 1 again, it says, but it displeased Jonah. So what was it that displeased Jonah? Well, go back to Jonah 3 and look at verse number 1, Jonah 3, 1. The Bible says, notice, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, so here we have the command from God. It says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. And notice what, what that command was in verse 2. It says, arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. See, in Jonah chapter 1, God had told, God had told Jonah, hey, go to Nineveh and preach to that great city the, the bidding that I bid thee, the preaching that I bid thee to preach. And what does Jonah do in verse chapter 1? He flees from the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And so we see the command from God is to go and to preach unto Nineveh. Look at verse Jonah 3, verse 3. It goes on and says, So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, notice, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So Jonah goes to Nineveh. He preaches, hey, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And notice the outcome, the result of Jonah's preaching in verse number 5. It says, so the people of Nineveh, what, believed God and proclaimed the fast and put sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. You see, it says that the people of Nineveh, they did what? They believed the word of God. They believed the preaching from Jonah and they were repentant. Look at verse 10, Jonah 3.10. Notice, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God, notice, repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. You see, God was going to destroy Nineveh. But God, in his mercy, in his kindness, he sends a prophet of God, he sends Jonah to preach that they should turn from the evil way. And the city of Nineveh believed the Lord, and they get right with God. But notice the next verse in verse number 1, it says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and was very angry. What was it that displeased Jonah? It was the fact that Nineveh got right with God. You see, Jonah did not want Nineveh to be spared. Jonah wanted God to destroy Nineveh. And we see a source of bitterness. The same source that happens for Jonah are the same things that happen to you. When you, in your life, when you don't get what you want in life, when you don't get what you think you deserve, see, what Jonah wanted Jonah wanted Nineveh to be wiped out. Jonah wanted Nineveh to get, to get ruined, but it didn't happen. Jonah did not get what he wanted. Nineveh got right with God, and it displeased him. And in many ways, this is a source of bitterness in your life. When you, in your life, when you don't get what you want in life, and it can cause bitterness, you can get angry, resentful when you in your life, when you don't get what you want, when you don't get what you think you deserve. Look at Jonah 4 in verse number 2 again. It says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before the Tarshish. Notice, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. See, Jonah's telling God, hey, this is the reason why I didn't want to go. Because I didn't want Nineveh to be spared. Yeah. I wanted Nineveh to get ruined, but he didn't get what he wanted. And look, and in your life, in my life, you, you don't always get what you want in life. And isn't it true Amen. that we don't always get the things that we want in life? Yeah. And we should be okay with that. You know, in life, in your relationships with your friends, you're not always going to get what you want. With your parents or your kids in life, you're not always going to get what you want in life. In your relationships, in your spouse, in your marriage, you're not always going to get what you want. Even in a church setting, with other people in church, with the leadership, like in life, in general, you're not always going to get what you want in life. And we see that this is a source of bitterness for Jonah. But you should be okay. You should learn to be okay with not getting everything that you want in life. Amen. You know, I'm traveling with my daughter, Amelia, 
And one thing I noticed about kids, she's only four, is that she always wants everything. Daddy, I want this. Daddy, I want that. But you have to say no sometimes. And look, we're training them to say, hey, it's okay for you not to get everything you want. You know, we're not raising brats because if you just give them what they want, they're going to get angry when they don't get what they want. Yeah. Right? And go, go if you went to Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. He replaced in Jonah 4. But you know, our Savior taught us that in life, we don't always get what we want, but that should be okay for you. You should learn to be told no sometimes. And look, in life, God sometimes has to tell you no. And when people always get upset at being told no, it just shows, look, you haven't matured yet. You need to grow up. And in life, look, we don't always get what we want. Life, life isn't always me, 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 my, 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 I'm going to get my way. No, in life, you should be okay with people telling you no. And we hear, in Luke 22, we see a good example. We see our Savior who wanted something, but he didn't get what he wanted. But you know, he taught us that it's okay in life to not get what you want. In Luke 22, look at verse number 39. The Bible says, and he came out and went as he was once. Notice, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And with verse 40, and when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. Here we have Jesus Christ before he goes to the cross, before he's going to be <clears throat> crucified, he goes to the Father in prayer. And notice the request that he asked from the Father, verse 41. And he was withdrawn from the, about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, notice, Father, notice, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. He's going to the Father, he says, God, if you're willing, Father, take this cup away from me. You know, humanly, Jesus Christ, he didn't want to go through that pain. He didn't want to go through that suffering. He didn't want to go through the cross because he knew it was going to be painful. He knew it was going to hurt. But notice what, his, what he says in verse 42. He says, nevertheless, he says, not my will, notice, but thine be done. You see, often in life, and here our Savior is teaching us that it's okay in life when you don't get what you want. And look, in life, you're not always going to get what you want. Don't allow that source of bitterness to creep up and thereby many be defiled. You should be okay in life with God sometimes telling you no. And look, it may not be your will. If you want something so bad, but God just says no, it may not be God's will. And you should be learn to be okay with that. You know, I'm teaching my daughter that in life, when she wants things, I'm not always going to say yes. And she should not throw a fit. She should not get upset. She shouldn't get an attitude. But often adults will get an attitude when they're told no. Look, you should be okay with God sometimes saying no. And here Jesus is telling us, look, it's okay for God to tell you no sometimes. And you should learn to be okay with that. Go back to Jonah chapter number 4. So what is a source of bitterness in your life when you, in life, when you don't get what you want or when you don't get what you think you deserve? See, Jonah, he wanted to destroy Nineveh. He wanted God to not be merciful. He wanted God to wipe them out. But God, being merciful, being kind, the people turned, and he spared them. And we see Jonah getting angry, upset, resentful, bitter, because he did not get what he wanted. But there's another source of bitterness that we see in Jonah. Jonah 4, look at verse number 5. Jonah 4, 5, the Bible says, So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow, notice, till he might see what would become of the city. Notice what Jonah does. After he preaches to Nineveh, after Nineveh gets right with God, after God just spares Nineveh, Jonah sets up a booth and he's just watching Nineveh. Notice this, till he might see what would become of the city. See, Jonah is just waiting for God to destroy Nineveh. See, Jonah thinks that these people still deserve to be destroyed. And Jonah felt like he was wronged here. Like God somehow did him wrong by sparing Nineveh. Look at verse number 3. It says, Jonah 4, 3. Therefore now, O Lord, let us take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. It's to the point where Jonah doesn't even want to live anymore. He felt like he was wronged in life. And he's telling God, God, take away my life. Why? Because he thought that Nineveh deserved to be destroyed. And look, another source of bitterness in your life is when you feel like you have been done wrong in your life. When you feel like you've been done wrong, you get upset. And look, was Jonah right in this situation? Of course not. He was wrong, but he perceived that he had been done wrong in his life to the point where he's asking God to take away his life. So another source of bitterness that we see in Jonah that happens to you is when you, in your life, when you've been done wrong. And look, and was Jonah right? No. He was wrong, but sometimes what we see as God blessing others, we perceive as God doing us wrong. Isn't it true that sometimes when we see God blessing Nineveh, 
blessing other people, helping maybe our enemies or helping maybe other people, we somehow think that God is doing us wrong when we see God blessing somebody else. Keep your place here and join again. We go to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20. See, what's another source of bitterness? Not only is a source of bitterness when you don't get what you want, but another source of bitterness is that when you've been done wrong. And look, in, in this instant, instance, Jonah perceived that he had been done wrong. And obviously he was wrong, but sometimes in our lives, what we perceive as being done wrong is not really being done wrong. It's just we often see other people getting blessed, God blessing other people, and we perceive that, that, that that's God doing us somehow wrong. Matthew 20. And in Matthew 20, we see a parable that Jesus Christ spake. A parable, we see the parable of the householder who goes out and hires laborers to work in his vineyard. And in this parable in Matthew 20, the, the householder, he goes out and he hires men to work for a penny a day. And then later on in the day, he goes out at the third hour, in the sixth hour, in the ninth hour, the hour, all the way to the eleventh hour. And he tells all the rest of the men, he says, whatever is right, I'll give thee. Whatever is right, that's what I'm going to pay you. He told the first people, hey, I'm going to give you a penny for your day's wages. He told everyone else, hey, whatever's right, that's what I'm going to give you. And in Matthew 20, verse 8, we see when it comes to time to get paid. We see payday, right? In verse 8, we'll, we'll read, it says, So when even was come, notice, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. He's saying beginning from those who just got hired at the eleventh hour. We're going to pay them first. Notice, and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, notice, they received every man a penny. But notice, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. So get the picture. He hires the workers in the beginning of the day. He says, hey, I'm going to give you a penny for the day's work that you do. He hires people the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, the eleventh hour. When it comes time to get paid, those who just got hired an hour ago, they receive the penny, Right? And the first come, and notice, and they suppose, hey, I should get more. If they got a penny, then I should get more than a penny because, hey, I worked a lot more than they did. Now notice verse number 11. It says, and when they had received it, notice, they murmured. Notice, they became bitter. They became angry. They became upset at the householder. They murmured against the good men of the house. Verse 12 saying, these last have brought but one hour, and thou hast made them, notice, equal unto us which have borne the burden and heat of the day. Notice these men, were they done wrong? No. They were not done wrong because they had agreed to get paid a penny a day, but they yeah. perceived that they were done wrong because the good man was good to somebody else. Yeah. Because the good man gave them a penny the same way that they earned. Notice verse 13, it says, But he answered one of them and said, Notice, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that as thine, and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? And notice the end of verse 15. He says, Is thine eye evil because I am good? He said, Is your eye evil just because I'm good? Look, these men, they had agreed for a penny a day. And they got what they deserved. But they supposed, they perceived that the good men had done them wrong. Why? Because often in life, we get upset. We feel like we've been done wrong when we see God blessing other people. You see, when we start looking at other people, comparing with other people, there's always going to be something to complain about. Look, whenever you compare yourself with anything, with anyone or anything, you'll find a reason to complain. You'll find a reason to get better. And look, comparing will lead to complaining. And oftentimes, when we see that other guy at the job get the promotion, we feel like God is doing us wrong somehow. When we see God maybe exalting somebody else or giving somebody else the recognition that you feel like you deserve, we perceive that as God doing us wrong. And we allow ourselves to do what? To get bitter, to get upset. Yeah. Hey, why does that person get the promotion? Why does that person get the recognition? Why does that person have the nice house, the nice car? Why is God blessing them? Doesn't God see what, he, what, what I've been doing in my life? But oftentimes what we think is God doing us wrong is just a perception. And it's a wrong perception. And Jonah, to the point where he wanted God to take away his life because of that root of bitterness. But you know what? Jonah was wrong and God was right. Yep. So don't allow yourself to look at other people and see God blessing somebody else as God doing you some sort of wrong. Go if you would to uh, 
Go to 1 Peter chapter number 2. See, a source of bitterness is when you don't get what you want. Another source is when you perceive that you've been done wrong. But another source is actually being done wrong. And this, this does not apply to Jonah. But in life, it's true that there are times when you've been done wrong, and it's, and it's true. And you are actually wrong in life. 1 Peter 2, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God, notice, endure grief. Notice what it says, suffering wrongfully. Look, in life, you will be done wrong. In my life, I have been done wrong. And if we were to allow you to come up here and tell us your story about the times that you've literally been done wrong, then you know what? I guarantee you we would agree with you. We would agree with you. And it, it hurt. And you would probably be right that it's true. Yeah, you've been done wrong in life. And look, all of us, we've been done wrong with, in life. If we allow Brother Corbin to come up here and tell us his story when he's been done wrong, I'm sure we'd agree with it. If we allow you to tell us your story, hey, this person did me wrong. This person cheated me. This person did this to me. This person did that to me. I was done wrong in my life. I would say, you know what? You're right. And you actually were done wrong in life. And look, it hurts. There's grieving. It says, endure grief. It doesn't hurt to be done wrong in life. And I'm sure you have been done wrong. Suffering wrongfully. But look, these things are going to happen. And there's a way that we handle these situations. Keep reading in verse number 20. It says, for what glory is it if, notice, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take patiently, notice, but if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. There are times, I'm sure, that you've done right, that you've worked hard, that you did deserve something, and you are actually done wrong. But you have to understand, at the end of the day, even though, yes, you have been done wrong, even though, yes, you're probably right, at the end of the day, bitterness only hurts you. At the end of the day, you being bitter, you being resentful, you being angry and upset, even though it's probably valid, even though you're probably right, at the end of the day, you being bitter hurts nobody but you. Yeah. It doesn't defile someone else. It won't ruin somebody else's life. It's only going to ruin your life. You say, but well, you don't understand. They did this and did that. You know, you're probably right. But at the end of the day, you being bitter will kill, harm, hurt, destroy your own life. It's not going to destroy their life. It'll destroy you in life. Keep reading verse 21. It says, For even here too were ye called, because notice Christ also what? Suffered for us. Doing what? Leaving us an example. They should follow his steps. You know, Jesus Christ did not deserve the suffering that he got. Right. That's what you deserve. Right. That's what I deserve. But do you see Jesus Christ being bitter about it today? No. Being angry about it? holding it over our heads, say, hey, this is what you deserve, and look, you're not even living for me, and look what I did for you. Is he doing that? Is he holding our sins over us? Is he bitter against us? No. And notice what it says, suffering wrongfully, leaving us what? An example. Look, in life, it's going to hurt. It's going to grieve. And, you sh and sometimes it's okay to be sad. It's okay to, to go to people and look for comfort, but these things are going to happen. You will be done wrong in life, and, look, and bitterness will only destroy you. Keep reading, it says in verse 22, Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. Notice, when he suffers, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. It says, when he suffered, he threatened not. And look, it's, it's comforting when you read these verses, knowing that oftentimes when we've been done wrong, we feel like nobody understands. When we've been done wrong, we feel like we just want to be alone and nobody gets it. And look, Jonah, we see Jonah, who was a very lonely man, I feel like. And you should take comfort knowing that, you know what? Jesus Christ understands right. what you're going through. Jesus Christ was done wrong. He suffered wrongfully. He didn't deserve it. And you should go there to God knowing that, hey, you know what? Man may not understand, but God understands Amen. what it's like to suffer wrong. And in your life, look, you will be done wrong. It's going to happen. Is it right? It's not right, but to take comfort knowing that Jesus Christ, He understands. He suffered wrongfully. He knows what you're going through, and He's there for you. It says, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. He says, this is acceptable with God. And He left us an example. And look, so in your life and in my life, you will be done wrong. But it's okay sometimes. We should know that God understands. And God is with you. And I know when we've been done wrong, we feel like nobody gets it. But look, Jesus Christ understands it. So we see what? We see the source of bitterness. 
What is a source of bitterness is when, number one, when you don't get what you want in life. And in life, you're not always going to get what you want, you know. And what's another source? It's when you've been done wrong, whether you perceive it's done wrong or whether it's actually done wrong, these things are a source of bitterness. Go back to Jonah chapter number 4. But look, when it comes to the source of bitterness, you're going to Jonah 4. When it comes to the source of bitterness, those are things we can't control. Look, we cannot control when we don't get what we want in life. We cannot control when people do us wrong. We can't control those things. What we can control is the growth of bitterness. And we see in Jonah 4, we see the growth of bitterness. How is it that bitterness grows in your life? And this is an area that you can control. You know, because you can't control people doing you wrong. And you can't control in life not getting what you want. That's uncontrollable. What's going to happen? Well, what you can't control is for that root of bitterness to spread and defile you. You can control it. But notice we see the growth of bitterness in Jonah 4.4. 4. It goes on and says in, in verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? And notice verse 5. Notice what Jonah does again. It says, So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, and sat under it in the shadow, notice, till he might see what would become of the city. And here we see the reason that bitterness grows in your life. You know, Jonah, you would think, after he goes through the storm in the sea, after God throws him into the water, after he gets swallowed up by a fish, after he goes to preaches in Nineveh, after they get right, you would think Jonah would just move on with his life. But no, what does he do? He goes out of the city, he pitches a booth, and what does he do? And he just watches Nineveh. And he's just looking at Nineveh. And he's just watching and looking and fixating his life. All I can think about is Nineveh. All I care about is Nineveh getting destroyed. And look, when you get fixated on something, that will allow bitterness to grow in your life. Amen. When you just fix it on the problems, when you just focus on the issues, when somebody did me wrong, all you do is you think about it, you talk about it, you play it over in your head, in your head. When you don't get what you want, you just complain about it, you talk about it, you fix it, you put your booth, and you just stare at it and look at it, say, I didn't get what I want, and you just over and over, just keep talking about it, keep looking at it, and you allow a little thing to blow up. And you allow something that happened in your life to grow into this big, huge deal. And all your life, you're just focused on Nineveh. This is all I look at. This is all I talk about. This is all I think about. And you allow something that might be minor in life to grow into this big, huge thing because you just keep talking about it. You just keep fixating about it. And then all of a sudden, your life is consumed. And that little thing, that little root, has grown into this big, giant thing of bitterness where it just makes you angry and consumed and upset. And look, what you fixate on can consume you. Go to Matthew 6, if you go to Matthew chapter 6. The things that you focus on, that you fixate on, it can consume you in your life. And look, this can be both good and bad. When you focus and fixate your life on something. Matthew 6, look at verse number 22. Matthew 6, 22, the Bible says, The light of the body is the eye. In verse 22, if therefore that eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. This is that the light of the body is the eye. And look, and if your eye is single, if you're focused on the good things, the positive, it says your whole body will be full of light. But in the same way, look at verse number 23, it says, But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? You see, what you focus on what you put your attention to, it can consume you in your life. And it can go both good and bad. If you're focused on that thing which is evil, it'll consume you. Until all of you is in darkness. But if you're focused on the light, if you're just focused on that, look, that can consume you too. It can go both good and bad. So in your life, if you say, hey, I'm going to focus on the things of God. I'm going to read my Bible, go to church, talk about the hymns, sing hymns, serve God with my life. Look, that can consume you for the better. But if you're just focused on sin and iniquity, on that which is darkness, that will overtake you too. But what you focus on can consume you. And when you've been done wrong, when you didn't get what you deserve, and all you do is just focus on that and talk about it and repeat it over and play it over in your head and just pitch your tent, I'm just going to watch the Nineveh, look, that will consume you in your life. And look, and if something happened to you in the past and you just talk about it again and again and again, it's the same story, this happened to me, this happened to me, Look, while, I, while it may be justified, and look, we understand your grief, look, it can consume you. Yep. And that little root of bitterness has now taken over your life, and that's all you're consumed about. You're just watching Nineveh over and over. This is all I care about. And you're consumed with something that you're just completely 
and utterly focused on it. And so look, so if maybe you've been done wrong or you're, you're le legitimately right where you've been done wrong, you didn't get what you wanted, look, choose to focus on something else. You need to shift your attention and focus your life on things that are positive Man. and not just rehash the same stories. Look, sometimes we allow little things in life to consume us. Why? Because instead of letting it go, we got to tell all our friends about it. Something so minor, we, we go home, we tell everyone about it, we put it on Facebook, put it online, we just rehash the story, hey, this happened, this happened, and something now tiny has become this big, huge thing because it's all you care about. Mm -hmm. Just Nineveh. Go to Proverbs 17. Proverbs chapter 17. So how does bitterness grow? Well, it grows when you just choose to fixate on something. When you choose to pitch your tent and just watch Nineveh. Fixate your Nineveh. Your whole life is about Nineveh. And now this little thing has blown up when God's just over it. God says, hey, just move on with your life. Right. But now it's this big huge thing because you're just looking at it. Proverbs 17, look at verse number 9. It says, he that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But notice, but he that what? Repeateth a matter separateth very friends. He that repeateth a matter separateth many friends. Look, you ought not to be throwing, if in, your, in your relationships, in your marriage, if something happened, you got to let it go. If you just, if you just keep man. repeating a matter, you did this, you did this in the past, in the past, like it's in the past. you got to let it go. It says, he that repeateth the matter separated very friends. And look, in church, if you've been done wrong, somebody forgot to shake your hand, don't just go to the car, go online, tell everyone about it, make this big, huge deal about it. Why? Because he that covered a transgression seeketh love. But if you just repeat a matter over and over, over and over again, you're just, you're just hurting yourself. Amen. And you're hurting other people. And so in our relationships, when you get done wrong, sometimes you just got to let it go. Sometimes it's going to have to be okay. Don't just repeat a matter over and over. The Bible says, behold, how great a matter, a little fire can look. And with our tongues, we just repeat something over and over and over again. And we wonder why our relationships are ruined. Because all our life is consumed over they did me wrong or they did this or they did that. Look, you got to learn to let it go. And so in life, how is it that you can control that growth of bitterness? Don't get fixated on something. And if you're having a hard time, focus, get fixated on those things which are positive. And look, there's a lot to get busy with. We need to read our Bibles. Get busy reading your Bible. Most people don't read the Bible cover to cover. Make that a habit. Make, it, make something you do. Talk about, listen to preaching. Talk about the hymns. Sing the hymns. Look, focus your attention on that which is positive. Let thine eye be single so that your whole body can be full of light. Don't allow something small faster to grow up, grow up into this big, huge thing because you just fixate it over and over. At the end of the day, that will only destroy you. Go back to Jonah 4. So we see the source of bitterness. What is the source of bitterness when you in life, when you don't get what you want? And look, in life, you're not going to get what you want. When you feel like you've been done wrong, whether it's perceived or whether it's actually been done wrong, and look, in life you will be done wrong. This is how life goes. When we see the growth of bitterness. How does bitterness grow? When you get fixated and just over and over just watching it. But we see the result of bitterness. What will bitterness do in your life? Jonah 4, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before the Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentance of the evil. Notice Jonah saying, I knew this God. This is why I fled God. This is why I want nothing to do with Nineveh God. Look at verse 3. It says, Therefore now, Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. Jonah was a very self-centered person. When he didn't get what he wanted, it's all about him. I didn't get what I wanted. And look, bitterness, what does bitterness do? What's the result of you being bitter? That you will become a self-centered person. Where it's all about you. And you this and you that to the point where Jonah wants God to take his life. If I didn't get what I wanted, God, take away my life. And look, you will become a self-centered person when you allow bitterness to grow in your life. Go to Philippians 2. Philippians chapter 2. And as Christians, we should not be self Center people. Right. As Christians, we should be selfless. That's right. Our lives should not always be about us. And look, bitterness, it's all about you. And your past, and what happened to you, and your story, and you this, and you that. And if you don't get your way, you're going to throw this big fit, 
and want God to take away your life because I didn't get my way. But look, bitterness will make you become self-centered. And as Christians, our lives are not about us. As Christians, our lives should not be revolved around the things that we want. Philippians 2, look at verse number 3. It says, Amen. Let nothing be done through strife for what or vain glory about lifting yourself up. But notice, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem, notice, other better than themselves. You say, should I esteem other people in this church better than me? The answer is yes. Amen. Should I esteem other people in this world better than me? The answer is yes. When you've been done wrong, sometimes you should esteem that person better than you. Why? Because that's that's loneliness of mind. Not thinking that it's all about you, and they smudged my pumas, and they did this, and they didn't take my hand. Look, as Christians, our lives should be about other people. Yep. Look at verse number 3. It says, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee. I'm sorry, no. In uh, verse 4, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on notice on the things of others. You see, our lives are about others. And... Bitterness will only make you self-centered. It will, it will defile your walk with God when you're just consumed with your own life and your own problems. Look, we all have problems in life. And truth is, other people have it worse than you. Amen. Other people have it worse than me. Amen. You should use your testimony to help other people. Why? Because we're all here for the sake of others. In lowliness of mind, esteeming other people better than you. And so in your life, just put other people before you and realize that it's not all about you. Don't allow bitterness to make you self-centered. But there's another result that we see in bitterness. Go back to Jonah 4. Jonah chapter number 4. And look, this other one will make you a lonely person. Jonah chapter number 4. What's the other result of bitterness? Jonah 4, what? Notice, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Notice, and he was what? Very angry. Bitterness will make you an angry person. Yeah. Nobody likes an angry person. You ever meet the person who's just always upset? They got that face like they want to punch someone in the face. <laughs> Look, that's what bitterness will do to you. It'll make yeah. you an angry person. Don't be the person that's just always angry, always upset, always angry at something. And look at verse number 9. It says, And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be what? To be angry for the Lord? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. I would have not liked to have been Jonah's friend because he's just an angry person. Yeah. And look, but anger, I'm sorry, bitterness will make you angry. Go to Ecclesiastes 7, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes 7, look verse number 9. Ecclesiastes 7, 9. So what is the result of bitterness? Well, it'll make you self-centered. It'll also make you an angry person. You don't want to be that angry person that nobody wants to be around. Ecclesiastes 7, look, look, look at verse number 9, it says, be not hasty, my spirit, notice, to be angry, for anger rested in the bosom of fools. Don't be the person who's just ready, quick to be angry. And look, when you're bitter, you're just always angry. And you're unapproachable. And as Christians, we should be approachable people. Right. We should be kind and friendly people. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. Amen. But when people come to this church, what they need is friendly people. They don't need angry people. Right. The world is filled with angry people because they don't have the Lord. <laughs> but if you have the Lord, you should be a friendly person. Be right. happy. Be approachable. And anger will allow it, will make you to be alone. And nobody likes an angry person. Go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs chapter number 22. You see, what will bitterness do? It'll make you angry. You know, you should learn to smile a little bit. Everyone smile. Be happy, right? But bitterness will make you angry. Proverbs 22, like verse number 24, it says, Make no friendship with who? With an angry man. And with a furious man, thou shalt not go. Like verse 25, lest thou what? Learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. It says, make no friendship with an angry person. Nobody wants to be around the person that's always just angry all the time. Look, as Christians, we should be happy. We should have the joy of the Lord in our hearts. Amen. We should be joyful. You say, well, you don't know what they did to me in the past. Look, you're probably right. They did you wrong. You have to learn to let it go. Amen. So, what is the result of bitterness? We see that it'll make you self-centered. It'll make you an angry person. And these things ought not to be. But what is the solution to bitterness? And we don't get the solution from Jonah. We see that Jonah, at the end of the book, he's still angry. He's still upset. We don't see the solution here, but we find the solution in the Bible. Go to Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. What is the solution to bitterness? Because we see the, the source. Where does it come from? It comes from you not getting what you want in life. 
and in life you're not going to get what you want. It comes from people doing you wrong when you've been done wrong. And in life, people will do you wrong. But how does it grow? It grows in you. Fixate on something. Rehash it. Replay it over and over. And what will it do to you? It'll make you self-centered. It'll make you angry. But how do you fix bitterness? What is the solution to bitterness? Colossians 3, look at verse number 12. Colossians 3, 12, the Bible says, Put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, notice, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, Notice verse 13, forbearing one another. Notice, and what? Forgiving one another. Look, when you've been done wrong, you should be ready and willing to forgive. That's right. And put up with people. Forbearing one another. Forgiving one another. Notice, if any man had a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And look, forgiving is letting go. Amen. The same way that Christ forgave you, Christ separated your sins as far as the east is from the west. Yeah. He's not holding it over you and saying, if you mess up, I'm going to throw this in your face. That's bitterness. Yeah. No, Christ says, you know what? It's behind me. Mm -hmm. I'm over it. I'm not going to throw it in your face. It's gone. But in the same way, even as Christ forgave you, you ought to learn to forgive other people also. You say, but they did me wrong and it's legitimate and you're probably right. But you need to learn to forgive. Why? Because bitterness will only destroy you go to Philippians 3. Philippians 3, and verse number 13. Philippians 3, 13. <clears throat> Philippians 3, it says, Brethren, in verse 13, I count not myself to be apprehended, notice, but this one thing I do. Here we, we have Paul giving us one of the keys to the Christian life. One of the things that you will need in your life if you want to finish to the end. If you want to get to the end of the prize for the high calling God, what's one thing that you need? It says, but this one thing I do, notice, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Look, sometimes you need to just forget those things which are behind. Did it happen? It happened. You just got to move on and do what? And reach into those things which are before. Focus your attention on the future. Look, when you in your life, when your direction is just all on the past, you're never going to grow as a Christian. That's right. You're not going to you're not going to reach that mark. But what should you do? Focus ahead. And some things in life. They hurt, they let the scar, it's grievous, but you just need to let those things go. It goes on, it says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You say, what's the solution to bitterness? You need to forgive. You need to let go in life. Was it wrong? You're probably right, it was wrong. But at the end of the day, Jonah, bitterness will only destroy you. Go back to Hebrews 12, we'll end here. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, again, verse 14, Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which, notice, no man shall see the Lord. Verse 15, looking diligently, watching, being careful, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Notice, lest any root of bitterness bring up trouble to you, and thereby, notice, many be defiled. There are people who have quit churches because of bitterness. Because something happened, they just didn't want to get over it, and so they quit on God. You say, what's the best thing I can do for my marriage? What's the best thing I can do for my relationships, for my job, my work? Don't get bitter. And when things don't go your way, things don't happen the way you want them, you've been done wrong, learn to let go. And don't allow that root of bitterness to spring up and trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Let's pray.